So I want to keep looking at some of the tools that this study, the AIA did in 2014, suggested would be really important, would change the, the way or disrupt the way that we practice architecture and construction and, and building uh, performance uh, in, the, in the 2020s. One of the things that uh, McKinsey mentioned that I think has come to pass is the importance of the so-called Internet of Things which is the, the kind of key part of building modeling where you're collecting data from a much, much broader uh, range of sources and integrating it uh, digitally. McKinsey's definition of this was a network of low cost sensors, but also actuators. So buildings that can actually monitor themselves, uh, decide uh, how to operate and then open and close, for instance, uh, windows uh, as, as need be. The cost of these sensors has basically plummeted uh, ever since 2008. They're even further uh, or less expensive now. And uh, in 2014, the uh, McKinsey study suggested that there were a trillion things out in the world um, that could be usefully embedded with sensors, right? Could usefully collect data. In uh, about five years ago, when I first made this slide, nine billion devices already were. Um, now the estimate is that there's something like 30 billion that are actually uh, equipped with sensors that are measuring uh, something about the, the, the space that they're in. Why this has become important is that it allows buildings uh, to sort of optimize themselves autonomously. There is, of course, one school of thought that says that so-called uh, applied human intelligence, right? We can open windows when we're too hot. We can close blinds when we, when we see the sun. Um, that's certainly energy efficient, simple, relatively foolproof. But it doesn't, for instance, happen when the buildings are unoccupied. Uh, and so the, the theory behind inter, the Internet of Things is that you collect, the building collects data on itself, and then it's able to adjust itself to whatever the, the climate conditions are. So one possibility, for instance, is that the building uh, understands uh, population patterns. And when you show up, uh, the building kind of checks you in and tells you where to go. If the, the, the population of the building is low, it maybe collects people in the hot desks in one part of the building and shuts down the environmental control systems uh, in the rest of it. That's just one example on a, on a more kind of a simplistic level. We have things like Nest thermostats now, which in homes can sense the pattern of their users and can uh, adjust the temperature when there's no one in the house, for instance, uh, to allow it to be much, much cooler, or much, much warmer than uh, it, it would need to be uh, for us to be comfortable. These are programmable. You can adjust them uh, remotely. And this is one way that uh, on a sort of small scale level, buildings can both sense uh, the, the environment and sense use patterns uh, and adjust themselves accordingly. Um, again, Kieran Timberlake was one of the, the early uh, adopters of this and their uh, sort of post-occupancy evaluation technology of going into buildings and trying to understand how they were actually used and how they were uh, actually operative um, was one of the sort of kickstarters to the, the Internet of Things uh, idea. Um, it's one that's sort of quietly taken hold. Uh, it, it hasn't made sort of big headlines, but it does seem to be more and more pervasive and something that we are continually kind of wiring uh, our buildings to do, to understand or to, to be able to take action uh, to adjust themselves. The, a lot of the other disruptive technologies that McKinsey talked about were uh, around new materials and new processes. The one that's probably gotten the most notice is 3D printing, which we're very used to doing now on the desktop. Uh, most architecture studios and schools rely on 3D printing for things like model making. Um, that relates to both how we design and how we communicate. And the price of 3D printing has gone from thousands of dollars uh, to the low uh, triple digits. So desktop 3D printing is something that we see in offices and studios uh, today. 20 years ago, it, it was it was sort of still a, a, a very high-end technology. And it's one of the rare things we've seen that, that's taken so-called soft ideas, right? Digital modeling that happens completely within the, the computer and actually put it puts it out into the world, right? The, the difficult thing about a lot of these technologies is how you go from the software to the sort of hardware, or in some cases, the meatware, right? The things that actually uh, affect uh, human experience and, and, and human uh, settlement. 
We've seen a lot of 3D printing, for instance, in healthcare, uh, where uh, devices have to really be custom fit to individual bodies. So in dental work, for instance, or in joint replacement, uh, we see a lot of very advanced 3D uh, work. And we've seen it scale up to prototype construction sites, although this is one area that hasn't quite lived up to the hype uh, just yet. We have seen efforts at using 3D printing uh, combined with concrete technology to make prefabricated houses. Um, there have been uh, efforts to make uh, better, more efficient 3D masonry, which you see in the upper right. But the idea that you see in the lower right that we'll send these machines out to construction sites and they will very quickly uh, print up a, a house out of concrete. This has not quite happened yet. Um, it hasn't happened for a number of reasons. One is that the, the, the concrete work in a residential building is often the cheapest. Um, it's also true that labor unions have uh, had a, a few things to say about being replaced uh, by machines on the job site. And the things that really make houses work, electricity, plumbing, uh, as, and as we saw the, the sort of sensors and smart wiring that's going into more and more houses, these are things that still require the skill of a human electrician or a human plumber. And simply replacing the foundation work with a, a machine isn't really addressing the, the, the major costs uh, of residential construction. Other materials that are out there that are of interest are things like uh, graphene or uh, aerogels. Um, graphene is a, a, a conducting material that can be applied to thin films. So we can see things like uh, windows maybe that could be embedded with sensors that could feed back to, uh, to, to building management systems. Aerogels seem to hold a great deal of promise as insulators. These are very, very lightweight um, materials that, that, uh, that where the solid occupies only a fraction of the space. Yet the crystalline structure is such that they uh, have some uh, structural uh, sufficiency to them. We've seen aerogels used experimentally. This is Georgia Tech's solar decathlon project uh, from a few years ago. They're still way too expensive to see a common use, but they've proved themselves in, in sort of proof of concept projects uh, like this one. One material that arguably has had greater impact than, uh, than, than many people might have thought is high strength concrete. And we've seen concrete go from a, a strength of three or 4,000 PSI in the, the early to mid 20th century to more like 12 or 13,000 PSI today. That's important because A, it means we can build much taller buildings. So here you see 401 Wabash in Chicago, Burj Khalifa under construction on 432 Park Avenue in New York. None of these would be possible without these much stronger concretes. But it also means that on a smaller scale, we can use less of it, right? We can actually use less of this very carbon intensive material to perform the same structural tasks. So even though we don't think of concrete as maybe an advanced technology like graphene or aerogels, the increase in strength has been really remarkable. It's let us build to new heights, but it's also maybe going to let us build to greater uh, efficiencies. And one that McKinsey really didn't see coming and, and almost no one really saw coming was the, the rise of mass timber. Um, timber, of course, is a renewable resource. It's also one that can be easily hand worked. You may recall that it was one of the first lectures in the class because it's such a basic material and, and so vital to so much uh, construction in, in the pre-industrial age. Well, because of its very low uh, carbon uh, content or low, low uh, carbon dioxide production, uh, timbers really come back as a renewable and a, and a very sustainable material. Um, here you can see an early uh, passive house in Switzerland where uh, the thick wooden walls were designed to be both uh, insulating, but also to decrease the, the carbon footprint of, of the house itself. Uh, and as you can see, to add a, a, a real uh, color, right, a real warmth to the to the palette uh, inside. We've seen a lot of uh, uh, advances in the way that timber is manufactured. So things like cross laminated timber, which allows us to replace a concrete slab with a thick, solid timber uh, floor, is one of the major uh, advances that we've seen. That's allowed us to think about. Uh, timber on a scale that we've never really been able to build it, uh, build with it before. 
the, um, the, the, one of the major sort of proof of concepts was the, the first uh, more than 15-story building, which was the Stout House uh, in London, which used mass timber for this very, very large housing project. One of the ideas behind mass timber is that because it's solid and not lightweight, like the lumber we use to build uh, sort of um, uh, suburban houses, uh, it's less prone to fire. It's harder to ignite a, a mass timber structure because of the solid mass of, of, uh, of wood. It's not invulnerable to fire, though. And so these buildings do have to be sprinklered, and they do come with requirements that uh, include exiting and things like that. It's not quite as strong, obviously, as steel or concrete, and so the structure often takes up much more space uh, than we'd like, and it's relatively limited in spans. Very good for residential construction, not yet able to achieve the 40-foot spans or so that we need for typical office uh, or commercial construction. It's also, uh, it's, it does have some carbon footprint and there is only a limited amount of harvestable timber in the world. So it's not a, a, a cure-all for concrete uh, and steel, but it's certainly adding to the, the palette of materials that we have to work with. And even though it started off as a, a European innovation and, and found sort of niche markets in the United States, uh, it's now become part of the toolbox in, in, in a lot of uh, localities. Here, this is the, the current uh, record holder for height, an apartment tower uh, in Milwaukee, engineered by Thornton Tomasetti, that reached 19 stories. As you can see, it's a hybrid. The parking garage has to be of concrete, uh, both for fire and, and structural reasons. But all of the apartment uh, units above are in mass timber. And you can see that, again, that's become part of the pallet uh, on the interior. On the exterior, it's an apartment building, right? The, the, the mass timber very uh, cleanly sort of fits into the, the, the standard kind of um, approach to, to residential construction these days. Um, and there seems to be a great, there seems to be great uh, further potential for mass timber. In 2014, SOM uh, did a, a, a study where they reimagined a 40 story apartment tower that they built in Chicago. Uh, as a, a mass timber structure. And what they found was that while they needed uh, concrete for some of the elements uh, to, to get the stiffness that they needed into the structure, a really large number of the concrete elements could have been replaced by a contemporary timber uh, technology. We've not yet seen a 40-story uh, apartment tower in mass timber, but what SOM has proven is that it's at least structurally uh, feasible. We've also seen a lot of interest in taking traditional technologies and trying to make them into more uh, carbon neutral uh, 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 materials. So uh, MIT has been really active in trying to take waste products from, for instance, uh, coal-fired power plants in India and incorporate those into building materials. So using uh, waste material, recycling material that would otherwise go into a landfill, add a lot of toxic chemistry to the soil, uh, finding ways to lock that into masonry in a way that reuses this otherwise kind of toxic stuff, but that also lessens the amount of, of material we actually have to produce for something like, uh, for something like bricks. The materials that we've uh, developed certainly promise higher performance and certainly promise more efficient building. Um, but we always need to be just a little bit cautious, right? New materials have cropped up throughout the, the, uh, the course of human construction, sometimes with great uh, benefits, other times not so much. Um, in the 1920s, the sort of wonder material asbestos showed up everywhere. Uh, the fact that it was fireproof solved what was one of the big problems in the early 20th century. As we know today, asbestos had uh, really uh, horrific uh, implications for people's health, particularly uh, respiratory health. And the very fibers that made it fireproof are actually quite toxic to humans. So we've spent an awful lot of the last 20 or 30 years correcting that mistake, right? Something that we couldn't have known uh, at the time, but that only emerged uh, over, the, over the decades. We have seen a lot of these uh, advances begin to uh, increase their market share, begin to take hold uh, in, the, in, the, in the profession and in the, the construction industry. Uh, smart monitored materials and systems are certainly there. They're, they're kind of everywhere. They're part and parcel of uh, almost any major new building. Uh, and we're seeing renewable energy at kind of micro scales come down far enough to make them economically viable. Uh, solar panels in particular, 10 or 15 years ago, it was hard to imagine them ever paying for themselves. Uh, they amortize quite quickly now within, within a few years. 
we do see this kind of convergence where we're getting uh, smart buildings because of the Internet of Things. We're getting smart production with things like 3D printing, and we're getting increasingly better uh, simulated passive systems um, that all suggest this kind of convergence of uh, this convergence into smart buildings that are more efficient, uh, more uh, cleanly built, um, and, and really conceived of in a much kind of smarter way, right? Buildings where we're able, with the knowledge that we get from modeling, the knowledge that we get from, uh, from monitoring, we're able to design those things, but we're also able to realize those buildings uh, in, a much, in a much brighter way. We haven't yet seen these like super high-tech materials uh, coming into play in, in, in a lot of uh, regular building situations. Carbon fiber, for instance, remains the material of the future. And it's hard to see aerogels and graphene getting uh, cheap enough in architecture uh, to really justify them, right? Usually we find these materials have to go through another industry uh, like aerospace or automotive uh, uh, fabrication before they end up making sense uh, in an architectural uh, situation. We do, however, see this idea about right tech, right? About, about materials like mass timber that seem to solve problems for the, the kind of uh, price points that we need to hit. We, get a, we do have a palette uh, of increasingly efficient, less carbon intensive uh, stuff. We also see new design opportunities in those. And the digital technologies that uh, allow us to design uh, more efficiently like Revit also allow us to produce more efficiently. We can take things out of the machine and put them onto the factory floor, onto the job site uh, much more simply. So we're seeing really a, a resurgence in prefabrication. And we've seen a lot of really interesting uh, developments, entrepreneurial developments in residential construction and in commercial construction where more and more of the building uh, fabrication and assembly is occurring in controlled conditions in the factory. And components are getting, to shipped out, are getting shipped out that are increasingly coordinated uh, back at the factory and simply bolted into place on site. Residential construction has benefited from this. This is a, 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 a firm that uh, for a while was producing uh, prefabricated houses and shipping them out uh, to, to various sites in, in the U.S. We've seen that happen uh, in uh, more mass housing sites, too. This is a, a company in Brooklyn that manufactured uh, units within, their, within an abandoned, a formerly abandoned um, naval shipyard trucked them out to the site and was able to simply crane them into place, saving a lot of uh, on-site labor. And you see one of their projects uh, down below. Maybe one of the more interesting ones of these was Atlantic Yards in Brooklyn that shop uh, architects uh, designed and controlled the, the production uh, process for. And even though it wasn't a perfectly smooth process, this was again sort of proof of concept that with the right software, with the right coordination between the digital technologies at the designer's desk and the digital fabrication technologies in the factory, um, you could not only coordinate the, the production of components, but with additional software, you can ensure that those components would show up at the, exactly the right time on the job site uh, to be craned into place. So all of these new tools uh, have provided us tremendous opportunities in making more optimized, more efficient uh, construction. They also raise some questions. And one of the major questions, of course, is optimization for whom and for what purpose. In the last segment of this lecture, I want to return to the kind of philosophical framework that we looked at shortly after the, that first big burst of industrialization, when the Crystal Palace really uh, condensed an awful lot of thinking about the, the moral and the ethical, ontological and the aesthetic consequences of industrialization. I want to take that same framework and apply it to some of the technologies that we're dealing with today and ask some of the, the same questions. And in that sense, to kind of bring the course full circle and to talk about uh, not just where we stand, but also how things have developed uh, over the last 3,500 years.